Good morning. Let's go ahead and uh, get started. It is my great, great pleasure to welcome you all to Northeastern to our two-week long uh, May Institute. We have a very exciting program for the full two weeks with fantastic instructors, and I'm really happy to uh, see you here as well. I know many of you have traveled from far away. It is, it is wonderful. So let's see. We have a few housekeeping items. So as you have heard already, we are using Piazza for communications. We will have some uh, uh, catering at uh, 10 o'clock, and we'll have a food team for those of you who want to bring uh, lunch. So we will have some uh, social activities, such as the dinner on Wednesday, we have some games and so on. So I hope that in addition to just listening to lectures and also doing hands-on exercises, you will actually have a lot of opportunities to talk to each other and get people to work on problems which are maybe similar or related to uh, what you do. So without further ado, let me welcome our first speaker, Sue Abatiello. So Sue has been involved in targeted mass spectrometry programming for many years, and she has led uh, many projects, in particular CPTAC uh, project during her time at the World Institute. So more recently, she moved to the of Fisher. And she has been participating in this uh, program for quite some time, so this is a fantastic project, very fantastic project. Thank you very much. Hi, everyone. Before I start, I just wanted to get an idea of where people are coming into this class with regards to targeted peptide quantitation. Has anyone done targeted peptide quantitation in a lab before? Raise your hand. Right, okay. Um, is anyone using it routinely? Okay, good. Experts. Uh, <laughs> is anyone here who's never really worked with a mass spectrometer or been in a lab to do this kind of work? Good. Okay. All right, so um, this may not be reaching all levels all at the same time, so please stop us along the way if you have questions. We've got Lindsay Pino, who's in the back. She'll be speaking up on the next couple of sessions. She's right now a graduate student in Mike McCoss's lab at the University of Washington, and she also worked at the Broad Institute while I was there doing targeted peptide quantitation. And then, I don't know, Brendan is the famous Skyline guy who is kind of the reason we're all here, <laughs> generated uh, the software over a decade ago, a decade ago, yeah, we're I think at 10 years now, um, and without him, what I do would definitely be more painful if not possible at all. So just a quick overview, um, we'll go over the, the next couple of days here. We want to get everyone to the same place where they're able to set up a targeted LCMS method. Um, either using empirical data or information from literature. Um, obviously, we're focusing on Skyline, and then we'll look at refining and optimizing the method. Day two, we have a keynote lecture from Andy Hufnagel. He's also coming in from Washington State, and he will be presenting on high-density lipoprotein proteomics in chronic kidney disease, sort of a case study. Um, and then we'll address some other key concepts that are necessary to understand for targeted peptide quantitation, including uh, standards, uh, absolute quantitation method validation, calibration curves looking at LODLQ, and then review of the Skyline ecosystem. And then day three, uh, probably one of the more boring topics, but one of the most important is system suitability. And we'll go over data evaluation, auto QC, and then wrap up about midday. Anybody in the wrong class? Now's your time. All right, so we went through instructors. Great, so uh, when, <clears throat> many years ago when I started targeted peptide quantitation, um, it was very challenging because many thought mass spectrometers were not good at quantitation. There are a lot of variables that are difficult to take into account, um, and it's not a very high throughput technique. However, when we're able to use mass spectrometers to generate discovery data from tissues and proximal fluids like plasma or urine, um, we begin to generate data and hypotheses that then we can go and target using a triple plot. And so the process is somewhat slow because here you do very deep and thorough analysis of a small number of samples. 
and you detect a very large number of analytes. And then going into the targeted aspect, you begin to increase your number of samples while decreasing the number of analytes you wish to target. And then at the very end, uh, the goal is to have some kind of method that you could put into a high throughput type of environment where you would be able to analyze thousands of samples but look at a small number of targets, whether these are single peptide analytes uh, or several peptides from a given protein or peptides representing proteins in a pathway. Okay, so this next part will walk you through considerations. Before you even begin, I used to be the kind of person that would grab my pipetter and like run in the lab and start doing things, and I messed up so many times that I realized sometimes it's just easier to sit down with like paper and Excel and web and just investigate things before you get into the lab. Um, and so this will go over considerations for designing a targeted experiment, Quantitation by mass spectrometry is it even possible. We'll touch briefly on mass analyzers and evaluating your data. So first, before you begin, you need to sort of understand or be able to explain what your goals for doing targeted peptide quantitation is. Do you simply want to see if something's present versus absent, or do you want to see how much of it is there? Do you need to see if there's a two-fold change, a five-fold change, a ten-fold change, because all of these will have uh, an impact on how you want to design your experiment. Um, and then, of course, things like accuracy, uh, precision, reproducibility, linearity of your method. If, if you're looking to quantify something, but when you actually detect it in your sample, it's either below your limit of quantitation or above your limit of quantitation, that value is useless. So you need to define that range before you really begin. Okay. So a lot of people come to me. I work for Thermo now, and we have uh, customers that are new to peptide quantitation and they may not have standards or they may not have done targeted peptide quantitation before and they come to me with proteins, like what, here's the protein, I want to detect this. Some people do have standards or they have a targeted list of the peptides, the precursors and the product ions, but some of them don't. Um, so this is always a, an important consideration. Um, how or why was this protein candidate selected? Is there empirical data? Was there discovery data generated on a high-res accurate mass instrument. If there was, that's awesome. A lot of times there isn't. Um, and then also, is there a biological significance to this protein? Are you expecting to see changes between a control and uh, a diseased state or a time course? And then thinking about it on a more basic level, oh, how much of this protein might be in the sample? How many people here do nanoflow chromatography? and high flow or hundreds of microliters to a milliliter per minute? Okay. Um, so we are limited how much sample we can put into the system. With nano flow, it's, it's in the small microgram amounts. With high flow, we can go up to tens and maybe 100 microgram amounts. But if you think about it that way, how much of the protein is in that microgram of sample? And is it enough to detect on the mass spectrometer if we can detect 100 animals? Right? So these are just some simple math things that you can do before you even begin to see if this is even feasible um, and how much sample is available. If you, if, even if you do amino enrichment and you do depletion and all these other steps, do you need 10 liters of blood to detect that amount of protein in the sample because then the, the person you're getting the blood from is not going to be living anymore, right? That's, so that's kind of a thing to consider too. Um, how many targets are you looking after? This translates to how achievable this is in your mass spec method. And then, of course, the cost. Um, considering if you are looking to have a very high reproducible, highly accurate method, you would want to consider um, isotopically labeled standards, internal standards. And so these have an inherent cost with them, although they last for a long time. There is method development time on both the mass spectrometer and the LC. And then time, how long does it take to to acquire one sample and then analyze the data. Sometimes these days it's easier to acquire the data and it takes longer to analyze the data at the end. Uh, and then biological interferences. This is an important thing that many people don't consider until they plague you. Um, I had this problem early on with one of the targets I was looking at in undergrad or grad school. So <clears throat> it was something I became aware of early on and you have to figure out ways to, to deal with it. 
So the literature, never underestimate the literature. The internet is always open, so you can visit it at any time. Um, you can look for proteins of interest and see what kinds of like proteins are present um, out there in a proteome. You can do these blast sequences, which will help you determine if there's any other protein that's so similar, you wouldn't be able to tell it apart from the one you want to measure. Um, can you get at least 100 animals of this protein once it's digested into peptides on your column? Because right now, this is a reasonable limit without doing extensive sample preparation um, of being able to detect peptides on the column in these usual mass spectrometers that are out these days, both high-res accurate mass and triple quads. And this is for nanoflow in particular. How much sample will you need? Like I said, you need 10 liters of blood, you need 10 milligrams of cell lysate. How many cells will you have to grow and able to get this kind of amount of your targets on the column? And then investigate if the protein has been detected in the literature and what the sample prep was. So Lindsay and I were working on a phosphopeptide uh, method where we were trying, to, we, we found, uh, we were told to target phosphopeptides of biological interest. And we had a really hard time with some of the peptides behaving well chromatographically and being detected in the MS. And Lindsay finally went to the literature and said, oh, the only way these things were detected is if it went through a protein precipitation and then anti-peptide antibody and a lot of sample prep, and we weren't doing that. And so once we realized the reason we weren't getting good data was because we didn't do all these steps, we could have determined that before we even started. Um, all right, is the site-specific modification more important? How many people are very interested in protein phosphorylation or glycosylation? Right, those are wicked important. So uh, if you're analyzing something and that, that modification pops off, how useful is it to you? You might know the peptide sequence and the intact molecular weight, but if that phosphocyte or glycosylation site is of importance to you, then you have to figure out a way to preserve it. Okay. Yeah, and this is something that I've learned the hard way a couple of times. When you go to search the, liter the literature and you can't find anything, it's it could be for a variety of reasons, but the main two I found is that um, no one was able to get successful data for it, and you can't really publish negative results. Or the other one is that just no one thought of it before, and usually that one's less common. Usually the failure one is more common. If, if they had a journal on failures, I think I would be their top publishing author. Okay, so this is another thing to think about. This is a plot uh, that Lee Anderson made up many, many years ago, and this is looking at the dynamic range of protein expression in plasma. So plasma is pretty easy to, to come by. You can buy it in many places. This is looking at the log 10 concentration of these proteins expressed in plasma. The ones in blue are the ones that we usually have no major problems detecting without significant sample preparation. So you get your plasma, you digest it, you analyze it. A lot of these are detectable. However, they're not that interesting, right? So the ones that are interesting are these ones from tissue leakage, interleukins and cytokines, um, transcription factors, any other kind of really interesting protein. In order to get those, starting with the green going down to the red, you have to do some kind of sample prep. Because if you look at plasma has a concentration of total protein between 50 and 70 milligrams per milliliter. And so you can't take a microliter of plasma and put it on your column because you just put 70 micrograms on there. And the column capacity is one for nanoflow. Um, even then, those proteins down at the red range are not going to be concentrated or present enough for you to detect them straight away. Okay. So there are a couple sample enrichment steps that people have adopted over the years. Uh, if we begin here with your protein sample, whether it's a cell lysate, a tissue, or plasma, or urine, um, you, you figure out how much you have uh, in order to get a good amount that you can process. Some people do protein levels, so amino affinity purification. So for people that work with plasma, they have these really expensive antibody columns that take away the top 14 or so most abundant proteins. Plasma, or plasma has albumin, which makes up a huge percentage, like 90-something percent of the protein content in plasma. So if you can get rid of albumin, then it's sort of enriching all those other lesser abundant proteins. There's also cellular fractionation. I personally have never done this because it sounds really hard, but many other people have, and you can tell me I'm wrong if it's not hard. 
Then after digestion here, people usually use trypsin. Does anyone know why we use trypsin in the proteomics? Yes. That's C-terminal Exactly. So trypsin cleaves on the C-terminal side of arginine or lysine, which have charged side chains. And so when we analyze peptides using mass spectrometry, they're ionized. And it's good that they have charges. Usually there's a charge held on the N-terminus and the C-terminus, so we tend to see doubly charged peptides, or sometimes triply charged depending on their amino acid sequence, and it makes it easier. Um, so pretty much every peptide we detect has an arginine or lysine at the C-terminus. Um, good. So then at the peptide level, there can be further enrichment processes that you could do to, to get down to the peptide that you want to detect. Um, I mean, uh, Mobilized metal affinity chromatography is what people use for enriching the phosphoproteome or phosphopeptides after they're digested. Um, there is also anti-peptide antibody immunoaffinity. This was called Cisgappa. Um, and this is done where you have an antibody that's raised against a peptide, which is not as common as raising against a protein, but it works very well. You can start from a very complex mixture um, put in the antibody, usually put in an internal standard peptide for the peptide you're going to target. So you can look at um, ratios, and then you're left with a very, a much more simple protein mixture, peptide mixture in the end, with the analytes of interest. And then there's also offline fractionation. People have done strong cation exchange or basic reverse phase. So you take your sample, <laughs> split it into anywhere from four to 96 samples, and then you can either inject those individually or you can pool them and do a kind of strategy, but that's rather time consuming. Um, so nanochromatography is used here for sensitivity. It helps boost the signal that you see without having to load a lot of sample. Um, usually people working with plasma don't have a problem with uh, getting enough protein because plasma is so concentrated, but uh, being able to see such a nice increase in the intensity is an effect that we get from nanoflow. It's a pain if you're used to high flow and quick methods, getting the same results out of nanoflow um, are, is difficult. I'm a long time nanoflow user and recently I've had to go to high flow and everything is so much quicker. And if there's a leak, you can see the leak because you get a puddle on the floor. Whereas with nano, you're like, ah, something's wrong, but I don't know. So um, anyway, this is just some simple math to give you an idea of how much sample you would need to, to figure out that you would need for doing your analysis. So, Right now, we're at the level of sensitivity where we can get about a hun hundreds of atomoles per microgram of protein digest when loaded on a nanofoil column. Um, this is improved if you go to any kind of enrichment like IMAC for phosphopeptides where you still detect this amount on the mass spectrometer, but now it's per one milligram of protein because you've done some enrichment and you're able to improve the detection limits, even though this detection limit on the instrument is still around 100 animals, uh, because you've done the enrichment, it's increasing the amount of protein you're starting with. And so this gives you an idea of, for plasma, the equivalent sample volume that is required to look at a microgram of neat plasma, 15 micro or nanoliters. We don't work with volumes that small, we usually start with microliters and we dilute and we do other things. Um, but that's the amount of plasma volume equivalent that we analyze when doing one microgram with no enrichment. If we do depletion, it increases the plasma volume equivalent to 220 nanoliters. If we do orthogonal chromatography, now we're up into the middle uh, micro microliter range, and which is still very small if you think about it. <clears throat> and then antibody enrichment, we can get up to the milliliter range, where you start with a milliliter, put your antibody in, and you're able to enrich from that amount. Does anyone know why we do LC, MS, and MS2 fragmentation? This kind of gives it away. Why don't we just take our sample and infuse it into the mass spectrometer? It seems a lot more simple. Right, it's too much for the mass spectrometer. The, the, the chromatography separates things out based on time and gives it a smaller amount of the sample to look at at every moment, and this helps. Uh, with every level of separation, which is what this is showing, stages of analysis is equated to separation. Um, we usually see 
a decrease in the signal because you think you're doing offline fractionation, some of your sample is going to be left behind. Uh, for example, if you're doing digestion, you don't always get 100% recovery. However, the decrease in the signal associated with every stage of analysis is less than the decrease in the noise. And so doing two stages of separation, or just the LC with accurate mass uh, MS1, if we go to three stages of separation, that's LC, MS, MS, which gives us the fragmentation, the product diet, so now we can identify the peptides. And this is improving the selectivity. Um, so these can be built upon one another, and you can increase the, um, I guess, the, the, the stages of separation. As long as they provide something that's orthogonal or different than the others, then the effect can be quite profound. And this is where a lot of the technology is moving these days into, well, we do LC, MS, MS, what can we insert in that process to make it easier? Um, <clears throat> this is a nice slide that I got from a colleague at Waters, which is the reason why the, the move from high flow rates, uh, so flow rate is on this axis, high flow rates uh, versus nano flow rates, and how there's this zone in the center where it's more robust than nanoflow and easier to use than nanoflow, um, but it gets you a signal boost from high flow. So if you're normally doing milliliters per minute or hundreds of microliters per minute, you can actually get a signal boost over here, um, a sensitivity improvement if you reduce the flow rate. And you don't have to go all the way to nanoflow to see a signal increase, particularly if you want to maintain a robust HPLC. Any questions so far? Okay. I'm not going to go through all of these, but they are really nice references. Oh yes, question in the back. Um, can you the slides? Yeah, uh, there, on Gaza, there's a link to our um, uh, G-Drive Blue Drive. You can go to the slides. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, so Early on, people were doing uh, quantitation um, of analytes that they were detecting using mass spectrometry, but it didn't really take off until the early 2000s. Um, this was one of the, I guess, the more pivotal papers where someone was able to quantify a protein using isotope dilution. They had a labeled protein that they spiked into a sample, digested it, and analyzed the peptides. This was done in a very simple matrix, though, so there wasn't the complications of interferences or other issues. Um, and then as the years progressed, people got into, I don't know, iCAT is an older technology. This was out when I was in grad school. Um, it, it worked with uh, labeled tags, similar to TMT that's on the market these days that many people use. Um, SILAC, where you're able to label your proteins as they're expressed in media, which is really great, but you can't really use that on human plasma. So it has its uh, drawbacks. And this one was doing absolute quantitation, this is what they call absolute quantitation, where they were using isotopically labeled peptides. They were spiking these into the digests and quantifying light and heavy ratios from the sample. So before I went to grad school, I was trying to quantify a protein from a sample using mass spectrometry because it gives some kind of signal and usually the intensity of that signal is related to how much protein is in there. Um, but there, as I mentioned earlier, there are a lot of other factors. But the way I tried to think about it was uh, Beer's law has this absorbance is uh, equal to the concentration path length and then some extinction coefficient. In, in whether, I guess it's UV. So you can calculate this extinction coefficient or measure it empirically if you know some of the other variables in the equation. Now, over here, if we equate this but to mass spectrometry, we have the signal, which would be the MS intensity. It should be equal to some kind of coefficient. I'm throwing in ionization here because that's the one that's most obvious. Um, times the concentration plus some kind of background signal. So the equation is a little bit different, and it's difficult for us to figure out what the ionization efficiency is. Does anyone know why that is? This one's tricky. Right? 
right? So if you have a peptide or an analyte at a concentration in solvent, it will have a different ionization efficiency than if it's in a background of other things that are competing for the charge. So its intensity will not be the same in a solvent background versus a complex sample background, even with chromatography. And it's really hard to gauge that because plasma is very similar, cell lysates are very similar, but until you can uh, generate the empirical data to determine what the signal is in a specific background, and then you can confirm that background is reproducible from sample to sample, this ionization efficiency is kind of a, it's like an undefined variable. So this makes it challenging, and this is why we use internal standards. So the stable isotope dilution MS approach uses isotopically labeled amino acids. So because we use trypsin, and every peptide should have an arginine or a lysine at its C terminus, these are isotopically labeled uh, with C13 atoms, and they're synthesized and uh, purified so that they can be, the concentration is known and you spike them into the sample. Um, this works really well because these peptides very well co-elute chromatographically with the unlabeled form that would be present in the sample, and then when they fragment, they generate the same product ions with the same relative intensities as the unlabeled form. So I feel like this was kind of a stroke of luck that Mother Nature gave to us that we could do this um, because it, it seems to work very, very well. <clears throat> Is anyone not familiar with peptide fragmentation, the B ions and the Y ions? I can do a, little, do a little quick thing. Okay, quick thing. This is a peptide backbone, and the way uh, we normally produce pep, uh, fragment ions is through collision induced association or, or high energy collision induced association. And usually that generates these BY ion products where it's breaking the amide bond, and anything that retains a charge on the N terminus this way will be called a B ion and then the number will be how close it is to the N terminus. Anything that retains the charge on the C terminus will be called a Y ion, and those are numbered this way, starting with one at the very uh, last amino acid on the C terminus. And so when peptides fragment, um, they often create something that looks like a ladder pattern in the mass spectrum. And if you look at them for long enough, your eye just begins to recognize, like, that's a peptide, that's a peptide. That's a peptide. Uh, I kind of do that too much. This is an example of a peptide, and then it's isotopically labeled form, where here, the phenylalanine is what was labeled. Um, this was before people were using isotopically labeled arginine and lysine. And so here, you can see the Y2 ion is right between uh, the threonine and the phenylalanine, and so it has the same mass, and that's not really good to differentiate the presence of these two. Um, the Y3, same, it doesn't incorporate that phenylalanine into the product ion, but you look over where there's the B9 minus water and the B8 minus water, those are different by mass because the B9 is over here and the B8. <clears throat> Any questions so far? Is it wrong to use a product ion like this for detection and quantitation? Anyone have an opinion on this? <laughs> it's wrong. Who would use that? Who would use that ion? I'm just curious. No one's able to commit. It's okay. It's not recommended because it doesn't differentiate those two product ions uh, or those two peptide forms. But if you have mm, few other product ions, it's not wrong. The main problem with picking very low mass to charge product ions is that there's a little bit more chemical noise in the product ion spectrum. And so the chance of it having interference present is higher than picking something with a higher mass to charge. Sometimes I will add product ions like that in just so I can ensure that I'm detecting what I think I am, but I may not use it for quantitation. Okay. So how this works is with isotope dilution, MS is you start with your mixture, you digest it, you have your peptides, you at some point add in your internal standard. Um, you may want to take it through a desalt process and then do online separation and detection. Um, 
when you extract the data, you get these things called extracted ion chromatograms. Sometimes we call them XICs. Uh, and you look at the relative intensities or peak areas between the internal standard and your analyte. And you use this simple equation where the peak area of the analyte divided by the peak area of the internal standard gives you their ratio. And then you can multiply this by the concentration of your internal standard to get the concentration of your analyte. Any questions on that? So you should have a response using this setup where you look at the ratio of the MS response analyte to internal standard versus ratio of their amount or concentration. You should get a Y equals X relationship. Most of the time you can, but there's often a contribution from the background chemical noise of your sample. If you were to do this kind of experiment in solvent, then you might get a y-intercept very close to zero, but if you're doing it in a complex sample, it's often not the case, and instead you would get uh, a nice linear range slope, and then it would tail off like a hockey stick. And so that's common, and I think Lindsay will be talking about that later. Um, so this is just a very brief comment on standards. Uh, they're expensive, especially if you want to get good ones that work well. Um, and they're not always necessary, particularly if you're just developing an assay in the beginning, but they do have an effect on the variability of what you're measuring. So this was a, a paper that came out several years ago that analyzed a sample that had different amounts of internal standards inside and uh, used them in the calculations or not. So here, this is using an internal standard. Um, so it was normalizing the peak area to that at every concentration point, and the coefficient of variation um, was about 1%. When they used something called a labeled reference peptide, where they spiked in peptides to the sample and normalized all of the analyte peptides to that one, then their coefficient, this is the same data, the same analytes that are being plotted, the coefficient of variation increased from 1% to 5%. And if they did label free, so no normalization, they just plotted peak area versus concentration, and they looked at the reproducibility, again, all the same data, the CV is much higher, 13%. So depending on what kind of reproducibility you want to be able to observe, internal standards can be very important. All right, so what do you want to target? If you have empirical data, this is awesome. It's a great place to start. You can get data-dependent acquisition runs from discovery data. Um, if you have pure protein standards or synthetic peptides, this is also another way to generate a product ion spectrum to see where things loop chromatographically and so on. Um, if you don't have empirical data, you can go to the literature. And I've done this with limited success. So it's, it's again, it's nice if the data are there. Um, it's not always there but it gives you a place to start. Or what if you have no idea? <clears throat> so again, if you have empirical data, consult it and <clears throat> see how things look. So, uh, right. I don't usually generate large volumes of data-dependent stuff. Most of my runs have been targeted over the last many, many years. And so when we do data-dependent analysis and we generate this huge list of peptides and proteins, I sit there and go, how am I going to look at each one? Because I'm used to looking at my data, all of my analytes that I target. I'm used to like, that one looks good and that one looks good. You can't go through many tens of thousands of spectra, right? Every run that you do, um, even though it might give you that calming feeling to know that, yeah, that looks like a real peptide. Um, <laughs> so we have software that helps. But I still would recommend, if you are picking something from a list, go look at the mass spectra and make sure that it's a good mass spectrum. Because they aren't always good, and the software does a pretty good job, but sometimes there will be an artificially good score when the product ion spectrum is not so good. Okay. So how do you use empirical data? Uh, for doing a data-dependent acquisition, you would search the data against proteomics libraries, identify peptides with a certain confidence, generate a list of peptides to each protein, and then target them but you need to make sure that each of those peptides is unique to the protein that you want to quantify. Um, so looking to the literature, we have hypothesis-driven versus discovery-driven type of uh, reports that are out there. Data other than MS data can, can help 
to support uh, changes in protein expression. And historically, a lot of this has been done by Western blotting. Um, has anyone ever done a Western? Yeah, they're god awful, aren't they? I don't like them um, because you can you can <laughs> you can kind of mess with the results, and then the signal that you're seeing isn't from your protein is from something bound to your protein, right? So it's not a direct measurement, and the linear range is not very good, um, but it's what people know. So a lot of time, if you publish a paper and you say, oh, this protein's changing by this much um, abundance in a sample, one of the reviewers may say, show me the Western. So anyway, um, right. So this also doesn't provide peptide data. So um, again, not a direct measurement. If you don't have data that you can or work with that you've generated. There are a lot of places where you can access it and this, if you Google these terms, you'll find websites that can show you different tools on how to look up and see if any peptides or your proteins of interest have been detected. And just a few examples, this is a website from Mike McCossie's lab called Passport where you can go in and look for a particular protein um, and then what they show is based on intensity, uh, the peptides that were detected from a tryptic digest, and there's a stability aspect to this, which is showing like this peptide is good and it doesn't decrease over time, um, or, or, right, doesn't decrease over time. Okay. The CPTAC cancer portal also has these methods that these are somewhat rigorously uh, there are rigorous requirements in order for someone to put these on this assay portal, but um, you can again go in and search by protein and you will get some details on the method. So this plot is the light and the heavy version of the peptide and then these are the product ion um, extracted ion chromatograms for, the, for each one. It's showing the linear response on a linear scale and on a log scale and then it also has repeatability requirements and you have to pass all these things before it's accepted onto the portal. So if you have a protein of interest, this is all searchable, you can go in and see how, how low the anticipated limit of detection and quantitation is direct from a sample. Um, right, so if you don't have any idea of where to start, but you do have a sample, you can just generate your data beginning at the beginning. Um, so Skyline has a great way to do a lot of this. You can begin with a FASTA file or a protein even just peptides themselves and start with the general rules. It'll help predict the, the peptide, mass to charge, and the product ions that are theoretically generated, and then you can go in and see if that's what is generated in actuality. <clears throat> okay, so let's just say you do have data and you can turn it into spectral libraries. How do you pick the, the best peptide transitions? And Skyline has helped streamline this process, uh, thankfully. So you begin with your data and you use Skyline to bring in the searched files and convert it to a spectral library. And then uh, you can pick a number of peptide targets from that and you'll see their product ion spectrums present. What I do normally is I will pick each peptide and I will get a number of product ions. Um, I'll overshoot so that I have things I can refine later and re remove as the process goes along. And then you can do either selective reaction monitoring or parallel reaction monitoring. So this one is on a triple quad, it's also called MRM. And then parallel reaction monitoring would be on a high-res accurate mass instrument, so you can collect all of the product ions, but you may not want to analyze all of them. Um, then what I do is I refine the process and I select the best three to five ions and I do a collision energy calculation, so I may optimize that. And in the end, you're left with a pretty refined list for uh, method optimization. Any questions? This process doesn't take long. It's a lot quicker than it used to be um, with the speed of the instruments. So when you started generating your data, um, let's just say, for example, we've got these two this is the same peptide sequence, but this is the plus two charge state and the plus three charge state. How many people would pick the plus two for targeting? Regina. How many people would pick the plus three form for targeting? Why? Intensity. Yes, so 
this is 4e to the 6th, and this is 160e to the 3. So it's at least right an order of magnitude or more, more intense. And so these are judgment calls that people have the option of making. Um, so yes, this y3 ion uh, is very intense. However, it's not very selective because a lot of peptides, all of the peptides either have an arginine or lysine C-terminus. And then if we look at the Y3, that's only a little chunk, three amino acids long. Um, and there may be a lot of overlap in this signal with other things in the sample. So the other I, I'm not sure which one this is, maybe a Y6, um, that's better. But uh, still, if you look at the signal to noise and all the junk that's here, it's a lot more complicated than it is for these three ions. So it's something to consider. What I would normally do is, if these are based on spectral library data I haven't targeted yet, I would pick them both. And I would target both of them and then choose the final charge state from my triple quad or HRAM data. Right. Any questions? Okay. So this is a beautiful peptide. You can see like almost all of the backbone ions are identified and some are really nice high mass charge and you don't see that little stuff in the, in the baseline like you do down here. But not all peptides are like that because sometimes you get this. And this is from a spectral library that got a good score. And you're like, what? <laughs> I, could, I could detect a doubly charged product ion and a B5, but uh, like that, there just aren't that many other ions that are good here. And it, this is kind of the luck of the draw in many cases. So for best results, I always recommend explore your data. Don't just assume that the software is doing everything right. No offense about Skyline, because it does a really good job. But more in terms of uh, database searches, you get scores. But if you're going to go and put the effort into target something, you might want to investigate it first. Um, use predictions and algorithms as a guide. But check the data manually, because you might learn something about it. Um, and you'll build experience in generating these targeted methods and you'll become more confident in their data. So this, I don't know if anyone's ever seen this before, but there are a bunch of blindfolded scientists that each feel a part of an elephant and each one has a different opinion of what it's like. And it's kind of like that where like, all right, that elephant would be an elephant and this one too probably. And Mr. Snuffleupagus doesn't have the ears, but he's got a lot of other elephant-like qualities, but this one, not, not so much. Um, okay. We'll go over briefly choices of mass spectrometers. How many people use the high res accurate mass like the QTOFs or the Q Exactive Orbitrap or, or oh, okay, that's good. <laughs> and then uh, triple quads, yay, that's my product, so I like triple quads. Um, you have a choice and the high res accurate mass instruments can target just often not as well as triple quads. Triple quads were designed to target. They don't explore samples very well. They can't uh, generate a full scan product ion very well, but for targeting, they do an amazing job. So these are just some comparisons of differences in mass analyzers. So in a triple quad, you've got ions coming through um, the quadruples, ramp and RF, and ions with a certain DC value and ions that make it through go into fragmentation and a further quad for detection. And then the things not making it through are just kind of dispersed. Uh, high resolving power instruments, there are a few of these that are out these days. So quadruple time of flight allows a front end ion filtering. And then fragmentation and the MS2, the longer that time of flight tube is, the better resolving power you get. And this gives uh, accurate mass as well. Ion trap, so this is, and, and it's not as commonly used, but there's a linear ion trap. For people that remember the LC cube from Thermo, that was a, a 3D ion trap. It has a ring electrode or these axis quadruples where the ions go in and they can be ejected uh, straight out or axially. And then the FTICR and the Orbi trap. Uh, this is a picture of an Orbi trap spindle but the, the way that these two instruments work is frequency-based. So you don't measure the MS, you measure a frequency of the ions as they progress through the mass analyzer, and that is converted to mass to charge based on complicated equations. All right, so just comparing the two major classes of 
triple quad versus high res accurate mass. The triple quad does not have high resolution, so that means anything past the first decimal place, you, you don't know what's going to happen. And the separation of peaks, if they do have differences at that first decimal place, you're not going to see those differences on a triple quad, where with high res accurate mass you are. Um, so triple quads give you nominal mass, which is really up to the decimal point and not after it. Accurate mass gets you sometimes down to three or four decimal places. Uh, this detects product ions on a list where the high res accurate mass generates all product ions. Many people think this is a huge benefit, but oftentimes it takes all of the method development you would do for a targeted method on the triple, and it puts it into the data analysis portion for high res accurate mass. So it's just showing the bottleneck around a little bit. Um, precursors are not usually monitored here on the triple, so if you have an interfering ion in the, in the MS1, you won't see it. You'll just see the product of whatever is happening in the MS2. And here, precursors can be monitored. This is a much lower cost where the high res accurate mass is a couple of times more than the triple. Um, and as for speed, they're getting to be on the same uh, page now with how many peptides you can analyze in a given run. Instrument cycle time is an important thing to remember because for quantitation, you want to make sure you have enough points across your chromatographic peak. If you have three, you have a triangle. And a triangle is good, but if your triangle is missing the apex of your signal, then you won't know exactly how much is in there and it won't be reproducible from run to run. So I always shoot for a minimum of eight, but aim for 10 to 15 points across your chromatographic peak so that the peak area can be very well determined every time. Um, triple quads are often designed so that you can define how many points per second you can generate. Um, and now some of the newer high-res accurate mass instruments can do that too. Normally you would have to figure out, well, my resolving power is this much and takes that much time, and how many MS2s am I going to do? And you would have to have a very good understanding of how long data acquisition takes. Uh, but now things are much m moving more towards the time realm and how many points can you get across your peak. Uh, right. <clears throat> on the triples and on the high-res accurate masses, uh, mass instruments, there are these dwell times or overhead or interscan delays. The interscan delays and dwell time are related to triples, but there are uh, overhead millisecond amounts of time that are mm, included in the scans. So it's usually not uh, a large quantity on the high-res accurate mass ones, but it can be on the triples. So it's just something else to ask about if you're looking to buy an instrument or if you're using it for the first time. Okay. So on a triple quad, We've got an interscan delay, which is the time it takes to go from whatever is being transmitted in each quad to the next thing on the list. Um, the dwell time is the time spent monitoring that signal in each of those quads. And this is predictable because you can usually set this value or you can determine what it is. On the high-res accurate mass, usually there's something like an injection time where it's accumulating ions for a specified period of time or to a specified target of ions. And then the detection time. And this is not always detectable, so you may not be able to say, I want 10 points across my peak and get 10 points across your peak. All right, and then SRM versus PRM versus internal standard trigger PRM. This is just showing some examples where this is SRM. This is parallel reaction monitoring, monitoring the same product ions, as well as internal standard triggered PRM. And the main difference is here is that uh, we can improve detection by spending a little more time on the product ions of interest. And in the middle one and the last one, they're all accum accumulated at the same time. Um, and that allows for targeted detection where as soon as the mass spec sees a bit of the internal standard, it turns on detection for all of the light product ions. So the technology is improving. It's not 100% there yet. But with people beginning to use it and evaluate it, um, we can make better modifications going forward. So the last portion of this will be addressing, uh, this is a really long title, the CPTAC study. So this was an initiative started in 2006 by the National Cancer Institute. And uh, CPTAC originally stood for um, Cancer Proteomic Technology, no, Clinical Proteomic Technology Assessment for Cancer. Um, and 
the group that I was a part of was tasked with developing and evaluating the technology for targeted peptide quantitation to improve whatever kind of detection we could for cancer. Um, this consortium was very large. We had uh, f uh, 10, 11 labs in the last study, 15 instruments. We had 42 authors on the paper. It was very, <laughs> very large. Um, but the goal of the last phase of the project where I was involved is we wanted to target 35 proteins in depleted plasma. And of those 35 proteins, we were specifically going after 123 peptides. Um, so all of them had multiple peptides per protein. We also had N15 isotopically labeled protein forms. So we not only had synthetic peptide standards, but we also had these N15 labeled proteins. So it was kind of a neat way for us to just assess the reproducibility and uh, recovery through the process. So if we had light proteins, or uh, yeah, we had light proteins, heavy proteins, depleted plasma that we digested with trypsin, then we would generate very similar peptides, except like heavy. Then we could spike in these C13 N15 labeled peptides, where the label is only on the C-terminus, whereas in, from the protein form, every nitrogen was labeled, heavy, was heavy labeled. So the product ion spectrum, and you can see here, the larger the product ion, the bigger the distance of that red product ion from the N15 labeled peptide than the other two. The other two, the blue and the green, would have a fixed distance uh, based on mass, but the shorter this product ion is, the fewer N15 atoms are included in it. Um, but the point here is now, instead of just light versus heavy, you have light, heavy, and super heavy. And if you know how much of your peptide you spiked in, that's going to be the closest to actually what you're detecting in the sample. If you know how much of the protein, the heavy protein you spiked in, um, that the amount that's calculated, that's observed at the end, is likely not 100% recovery because it's gone through this sample prep. The digestion might not be fully complete. Um, so it represents much more closely what is present from your light protein, but it definitely is going to have a reduced uh, signal in most cases. So we can determine recovery from the assay by looking at the light, which is the blue versus the green, which is the synthetic peptides, and then the figures of merit, like the limit of detection and quantitation, we would compare the two protein forms. So the goals of the work were to look at proteins that had some kind of cancer relevancy to improve feasibility by looking at more than peptides per protein, more than, more than 100 peptides in a method, um, to look at the limit of detection and quantitation and see how it improved based on previous studies, uh, to demonstrate true quantitative accuracy looking at these heavy labeled proteins. I don't think that many heavy labeled proteins were used to generate con uh, concentration curves previously. And then we had a blinded verification study where each of these labs had to analyze samples that they didn't know the concentration in a sp specific order. And then we would see how many labs, like the reproducibility and the accuracy of their outcome. Um, so we had, oh yeah, we also looked at system suitability. We had 35 proteins, 10 sites, 15 instruments, and this covered all the four main instrument vendors. This is a list of the protein targets. We also had these seven proteins that did not have protein heavy labeled internal standards, but they had triptych peptide synthetic internal standard um, peptides. So these were sort of controls that we could look at digestion efficiency and make sure these were consistent across every single sample. And then this is a walkthrough of how we went and set up the entire process. So again, we had the light and heavy proteins that were spiked into plasma, digested with trypsin, generated those peptides. We had a couple of labs with high-res accurate mass instruments run some data-dependent acquisition and do database searches. We brought these data in to generate the spectral libraries in Skyline. And from that, we knew which peptides we, we wanted to monitor, but this helped us sort of make it easier to look at which charge state and which product ions looks to be the best. Here we picked the top five product ions in Skyline, and then from here set, set them up on each of the different type of triple quads that were in the study to maximally, uh, to 
get the best results for each triple quad type. So we didn't just pick a transition list and apply it to every triple quad. We designed them specifically to get the best results per different triple quad. And then analyzed the data in Skyline, chose the best three product lines, did collision energy calculation. Uh, we didn't empirically optimize it for this study, um, at least not across all the labs but we were able to show that it wasn't really necessary anyway. And then the final transition list, when we did a method with only the light and heavy peptides, we had over 700 transitions. And then when we looked at all three forms, it was over 1,000. And this might not seem like a big deal now, but this was taking place in 2010 when this was a big deal. This was really hard. Um, but other things that we needed to look at was gradient development. So here, we looked at four different gradients. This green one was one that was uh, used pretty frequently by a lot of the labs because in a triple quad method, it was pretty quick. Um, and so we looked at the other ones to sort of shallow out the gradient, see if we could separate those peptides out because that green gradient is this one. And so all of our peptides and all of the sample matrix was coming out in like this five minute span, which doesn't help us. The intensity is the highest because all the peaks are super skinny and super tall but also everything is coming out then, so it was not the best gradient. Here we began teasing things apart, and now uh, the duty cycle, or the amount of time the instrument is actually collecting useful data is improved versus that gradient at the top. And so at the end of it, this is what it looks like to acquire like a thousand transitions. This was on a SIEX, um, so this was the plot that is presented in Analyst. Um, but at this time, I was really proud of this because I had never targeted so many peptides before in a triple quad. Other things that you need to consider when doing these kind of studies is digestion conditions. Everyone has their own favorite recipe, but it may not always work for what you need. So here we looked at uh, digesting in two molar urea with lysine, in four molar urea with lysine, and then adding trypsin after that. This is um, deoxy. which is sort of a detergent type uh, denaturant that you can acidify and it crashes out at the end, so you can minimize desalt. And then trifluoroethanol, which is a volatile solvent type of thing. And then we monitored all of these peptides, and for the most part, everything is really similar. There are some cases where one peptide may do very, very well in a particular kind of uh, denaturant and sample handling process, but uh, if it's just one, um, is that the one that you might want to pick? Uh, because this purple one does really well here, but for these peptides, you barely recover them. So this is another th thing that is worth looking at because you may be able to improve your reproducibility and sensitivity. And then this will be a topic for later, but I just wanted to touch on it. Looking at how to determine what the limit of detection and limit of quantitation is. You, you need to have a bunch of concentrations that cover this range and go be lower than the limit of detection. This is a way that it's a little extra work and there are ways that you can determine this without doing a lot of extensive sample analysis. But for starting off, I always think it's a great way to make sure that um, you're detecting nothing in a blank, nothing in a blank, and then you have a couple of points before you begin detecting your analyte so that you can show that at some point there is a, a signal. And then beyond that point, which would be down around here, then it becomes quantitative and linear because it isn't always. Okay, so in summary, consult the literature. It it's, doesn't take long. Literally, if, you, if you've spent 10 minutes looking for something and it's not in the literature, you could be in for a really hard go. Um, generate the data. If you have time on an instrument, then see what you can generate and then review those data. Don't just assume the software is going to do everything for you until you're very comfortable with it and trust it. Then I would recommend looking at the raw data. Um, evaluate if the data makes sense because usually if it doesn't make sense, something's going on and it's worth a little bit further investigation and then repeat until you're done and your boss is happy. Right. <laughs> All right. Any questions on that? Years. It was years. Oh my goodness. 
because there were so many labs involved, we tried to divvy up work and they tried to fit in analyses when they could. I think we gave everybody about three months to, to run the finalized protocol. And that was just fitting it in, dealing with instrument breakdowns, with columns going bad and all this. Um, the method development part took six months to a year. And then the data processing and evaluation took a long time. Um, Skyline, again, was pivotal in this because it took all of the data from every different vendor platform all in the same software. Whereas the previous study we did, we had Thermo triples and SciX triples, and so most of the people used Analyst and the other person used whatever Thermo had, and so we couldn't be sure that all of the data processing was on the same level. Um, but now, if I think if people were to do this kind of analysis, and I've been involved in multi-lab studies since then, it doesn't take as long. But in this particular one, it was a long time. <laughs> Anybody else? Also, the CPTAC workflow, um, when you were tagging the peptides, that was via a C13 tag or something like tails, or you would derivatize? So there is a company up here called Cambridge Isotope Lab that makes isotopically labeled amino acids. And so in the early days, we would buy that and then go to a peptide synthesis company and give them that. And as they seek, as they synthesize the peptide, uh, that heavy amino acid would be incorporated into the sequence. Um, and that's, I think, now you can just go to the peptide companies and they have all that ready to go. Building a biomarker discovery kind of project from LFQ or let's say TMT, you have done daily work. Mm -hmm. We got 200 bookings of interest with the last issue kind of project, and then you will still have at least 1,000 peptides. So, how are you going to narrow them down from the CP type portal or from passport? Do you think you, know, you can select some peptides which are going to be much more available for mass link? Yeah, if I had that many, I would first go to sites like passport or the CPTAC portal to see how many have uh, methods that have been developed or how much how many of them have preliminary data and I would prioritize those on the list and then sort and see in the literature or from the discovery data what looks good and kind of begin crossing things off the list um, I don't know that there is general consensus on how many peptides per protein is required to say whether that protein is present I mean two Three, uh, I think five is overkill. But again, it, it, it also depends if you're tracking proteoforms that you know may have some change, but the rest of the sequence is the same. Um, but yeah, going after that large number is challenging, um, and sticking with a high res accurate mass and screening a number of different samples may be a way to go, because then you can see without the TMT labeling and all the other stuff at doing more of a label-free quant approach um, without investing a lot of money in resources, just generating the data. You can kind of begin tracking what's there, what isn't, and then prioritize based on that. So with a matter of how many peptides you can actually you know, really monitor how transition to them? I've, I've got a method that's high flow, 35 minutes, where we have 965 peptides in one method. Um, it represents 200 plasma proteins give or take, and then 15 internal standards. That, that, that was all uh, like label-free. We were just detecting, we weren't quantifying. Um, but triple quads these days can have like millisecond dwell times, and so hundreds of peptides in a second is possible without scheduling, and then if you schedule their retention times, the numbers can go up. Is that with NOLC? NOLC. Oh, no, the 35-minute one was a high flow. But nano LC is it's similar. Usually the gradients are longer though, so it kind of works out to be the same. What PRM? That's going to be a little bit less per second. But if you schedule again, the time can go up. So I think they're on similar orders of what you can detect at a given point. Um, you just have to be very careful about how the PRM uh, <coughs> mass spec method is designed so that you get enough data across your peaks. People <coughs> Yeah, if you have those resources, that's probably what I would do. Because 
it is hard to jump from discovery right to targeted. Um, and sometimes having that transition step of, all right, now let's target these things on the high res accurate mass platform. Let's do PRM and see what we see. Then you can move that. It's sort of a stepwise progression to doing MRM on a triple versus discovery right to triple. So yeah, I think it makes it easier.